Like China Warrior, compare it to Nintendo's Kung Fu. Can you spot the difference? TurboGrafx-16 has 16-bit graphics that make characters up to 32 times bigger. TurboGrafx-16, the higher-energy video game system. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Ultimate TurboGrafx-16 review here on Player One Start. In the previous video, I went through the launch of the TurboGrafx-16 in the United States, and we took a look at all of the launch games for the system. However, I felt that the launch lineup of the TurboGrafx-16 left a lot to be desired, especially with the pack entitled Keep Courage in Alpha Zones. So to find out if the TurboGrafx-16 was dead on arrival or not because of its limited game selection, I decided to go ahead and keep going through the library until the end of 1989 to see if I found any games that would have been a killer app for me to personally purchase this console back in the day. Specifically, I'd like to take a look at how many of these genres started to get filled out, as there wasn't really much of a selection in terms of genres when the system was released. Two genres I would expect to see on a console's launch would be ports of arcade games, as those would be games that people had played before, and hence they are familiar with, as well as sports titles which seem to be universally accessible to a large audience. But that said, there were more games that launched in 1989, and again we're not going to go through all of them, but we are going to take a look at a few of them, so let's go ahead and do that now. Blazing Lasers, known as Gunhead in Japan, is a vertically scrolling shooter by Hudson Soft and Compile. It was released in Japan and North America in 1989 for the NEC PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16. It is based on the Japanese film Gunhead, but the references to the film were removed for the North American release. In the game, a fictional galaxy is under attack by an enemy space armada called the Dark Squadron, and the galaxy's only chance for survival is the Gunhead Advanced Starfighter, who must destroy the Dark Squadron and its super weapons. Immediately off the bat, you can tell the gameplay features fast vertical scrolling and a wide array of weapons for the player to use. This game was produced by the same personnel who developed other video game series such as Puyo Puyo and Super Bomberman. Being one of the first titles released on the TurboGrafx-16, it received critical praise for its graphical capabilities, lack of slowdown, intense gameplay, and sound. I have to tell you, being a fan of this genre, this is one of the better titles that I have played, especially around this time period. Had I received this title in 1989 for this console, I think I would have spent hours on end over and over trying to play through this game. One feature unique to the TurboGrafx-16 that I would have enjoyed over other consoles is the fact that the turbo button is built into the default controller, as it definitely comes in handy in this game. I would recommend this game to both casual and hardcore fans of space shooters, and would definitely recommend it as a pickup for your TurboGrafx-16 if you have one. China Warrior, known in Japan as the Kung Fu, is a horizontally scrolling beat-em-up game developed in 1987 by Hudson Soft, initially for the PC Engine, and again it was ported over early in the TurboGrafx-16's life cycle. In this game, a Chinese martial artist named Wang, whose style resembles that of, Bru whose style resembles that of Bruce Lee, embarks on a mission to bring down opposing enemies and the Dark Emperor, who stands atop a castle in China. Throughout each stage of the game, the object is to walk through the stage while throwing punches and kicks at enemies and objects. There are four levels total, which are broken down into three stages each, for a total of 12. When the character gets knocked out, the game starts over at the beginning of the stage in which he got knocked out. Players can memorize the object and enemy pattern. At the end of each level there is a boss fight, and at the end of each level there is a boss fight. After successfully being the boss, the player naturally goes on to the next level. The controls of the game are very similarly matched to the game Kung Fu Master. When the game was initially released in 1987 in Japan for the PC Engine, 
The character size and detail on each character was a positive selling point for the title. However, by the time it reached the US, the game faced much tougher competition against games like Last Battle and Altered Beast. Overall, I found this game mildly entertaining, but I found the gameplay gets repetitive very quickly. If I would have played this game back in 1989, I feel like that I wouldn't have wanted to purchase this title, but could have rented it a couple of times, or competed against my friends to see who could get a higher score. As I play this game in the modern day, I find myself wanting more, as there are other games that better expand upon this style of game. R-Type is a game I've covered before on this channel, specifically in the Ultimate Sega Master System review. So to sum up the gameplay, I will basically say that you are playing as the Starfighter on screen, and various power-ups are linked to this orb that will follow you around screen, allowing you to use a more powerful or a different type of weapon. So how does this game perform on the TurboGrafx-16? I'm gonna say it does an admirable job. There is the occasional slowdown every now and again, however the biggest thing I notice is that the sprite flickering is definitely a big issue here. Or at least more evident than on other consoles that I've played this game on. However, that doesn't entirely hinder your gameplay and I did get used to it very quickly. Overall, if you have not played this game before, this is not a bad port to start with and I would definitely recommend it on your TurboGrafx-16. One big difference to note here on the Japanese versus the American version of this game on this console is that the Japanese version was split across two Hue cards and a Part 1 and a Part 2. However, the TurboGrafx-16 version contains both games on one card. So while I usually recommend collecting on the PC Engine because it's cheaper, it may be worth it to go ahead and get just the one game for the TurboGrafx-16 in this case. Dungeon Explorer is an action role-playing game released for the PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16 in 1989. It is considered to be a pioneer title in the action role-playing genre, with its cooperative multiplayer gameplay which allowed up to five players to play simultaneously. In this game, players can play as a fighter, thief, warlock, witch, bishop, elf, bard, or gnome. Special classes like the Princess and Hermit can also be unlocked as the game progresses. The main difference in the type of character you pick is primarily in their black and white magic potion abilities. But other than that, the gameplay is pretty straightforward for an RPG. One feature I especially appreciate is the ability to save your game via a password system. The password system actually tracks the player's level, class, and four base stats, attack, strength, agility, and intelligence. This game was well-reviewed when it was released, but has since received a more mixed reception from reviewers since its re-release on digital platforms. However, I find this game to be a bit of a hidden gem, as I think this game has been overlooked a lot simply because of its title. I think this game would appeal to casual fans of RPGs, especially if you don't like to do a lot of strategy on your stats. This game does offer more action than anything else, in a gameplay style similar to Gauntlet. Overall, it is fair to say that I did enjoy this title, and I would definitely recommend it to someone who was looking at this console. Dragon Spirit initially launched in arcades in 1987. It is a vertical scrolling shooter game, which plays similarly to Namco's own Xevious. In this game, the player controls a dragon in an effort to rescue a princess. The game allows you to move in eight directions, and the player has access to two primary weapons. A flame projectile to destroy air-based enemies, and a bomb to destroy ground-stationed enemies. 
Again, the gameplay style reminds me a lot of Xevious, although the concept behind this game is a bit more drawn out and the story is more well developed, it all comes down to if you enjoy that gameplay style. The visuals are very eye-catching, and the music is also very catchy as well. I didn't really find too much of a problem with those aspects of the game, but I would still only recommend it to those of you that are hardcore fans of the shoot-'em-up genre, especially if you're a fan of games like Xevious. This game has consistently ranked around 7 out of 10 with modern-day reviewers as well as when it first came out. To sum up, it is really just another average shooter that you would definitely enjoy if you're a fan, but the casual player may grow tired of this formula very quickly. I've already looked at Fantasy Zone in both the Sega Master System review and the Sega Genesis review. But just to review, this is a side-scrolling shooter that allows you to go either forwards or backwards, as well as up and down the screen, and this game is regarded as one of the best shoot-'em-ups for people to get introduced to the shoot-'em-up genre. I have to say, when looking at other online reviews of this game, this version for the PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16 is among one of the highest regarded versions ever produced and I did find myself enjoying this title a lot. One thing I really enjoyed was having the turbo pad so I can set my rate of fire without having to press the button several times. Definitely one I would recommend on this console, even if you're not a big fan of the genre, it is a nice introduction, and it is done very well here on the TurboGrafx-16. <laughs> And speaking of shooters, it would be a good idea to go back to the granddaddy of shooters, which is Galaga. I guess remade for the 90s. Today, I have also looked at Galaga on the Atari 7800, Nintendo Entertainment System, and the Sega Game Gear. Power Golf was released by Hudson Soft for the TurboGrafx-16, and it became part of the Power Sports series of video games released between 1988 and 1998. And there's not much information about this game from the time of its release, other than many gamers overlooking this title. In this game, to make your shot, you select between the different clubs by pressing up and down on the D-pad, while changing the direction of your shot can be set by moving the left and right button, and when you press the action button, a power meter will appear to determine the strength of your shot. When you press the button again, a slider arrow moves quickly to the left. The farther left it goes, the more powerful the shot. In the blink of an eye, the arrow whizzes to the right, where you have to press the action button again to hit the sweet spot to determine how accurate your shot is. Although this game looks graphically appealing to me, I definitely found this mechanic to be a bit frustrating overall. Many times I've found myself struggling to hit that sweet spot because the slider moves way too fast when you press it again. Unfortunately, that wrecked the gameplay for me, and when looking at other online reviews of this game, I see that many were not very kind to this game as a result, giving it around 4 out of 10 stars. I would probably put it up more towards the 6 out of 10, saying that it's not necessarily a waste of time to play, but, with practice, I guess you can probably get used to that power slider. But unless you're a hardcore fan of early golf titles, this one is a skip. In terms of world-class baseball, I can't really give a proper perspective on this game, because when I was playing it, for some reason, I kept controlling both the pitcher and the batter at the same time. I'm not sure what was causing this glitch, but even changing controllers and selecting every different gameplay style I could in this game, it just kept doing that. So without giving my personal perspective, I can tell you that reviewers give this kind of an average rating saying that it's better than most of the 8-bit versions of baseball video games, but may only be enjoyed today by people who enjoy the retro-style baseball games of the early 90s.
I don't really have much to say about sports games, as again, I'm not a big fan of going back and playing the older ones, as I feel that most sports games are a sign of the times that they were released in. So without having any form of personal nostalgia for this game, I do feel that it's a very average to mediocre type of tennis game, I guess. The graphics look okay, but they're not even trying to fake any sort of 3D here. They just have a warped playfield that scrolls up and down the screen, and the character models are nothing to write home about. However, what completely passed by me the first time I played this game is that it has something called a quest mode, where, no joke, you play through this game like a role-playing game with tennis matches. And while that is unique, I have to say it would be better if I didn't have to play tennis to go through the story mode. But again, that's just my perspective. And lastly, we're going to look at Motor Rotor. And I gotta tell you, I did not enjoy this game in the slightest. The problem this game suffers with is that the controls don't move with you when you turn on the screen. So yes, if you're going in the opposite direction, the controls for your racer become reversed. And I would be tempted to give this game zero stars, but looking at other reviews, others have been more kind to this game, giving it around four to six stars. So it'd be kind of average to not so great. However, from my perspective, I would say avoid this one at all costs. So out of all of the early games of this system, one of my favorites has to be Blazing Lasers. I actually was really impressed with this title, and it does look very next-gen. The fact that it has an 8-bit CPU doesn't really seem to be as evident in here, except for I did notice some sprite flickering every now and again. Another game that caught my eye was Dungeon Explorer, and the only thing I think holds this game back is its title. This game was actually really fun to go through. It is a live-action RPG. You don't have to go and level up turn-based strategy or anything like that. It's actually more similar to a cross between Zelda and some of these early RPGs that came out for these systems. So this is one I would definitely recommend. This is another title that reminded me of a title on the Atari 7800, which was Dark Chambers. Except for this game takes that and ups the ante a little bit. And I definitely appreciate the password system, which is the only way you can save to this title. Now there were a few other titles that also caught my interest, but unfortunately we've run out of time for this video. Remember, if you do like what you see, please give this video a like. Also, let me know in the comments down below what you liked about today's video. Have you played any of these games? And if so, what have been your experiences with them? If not, what looks interesting that you want to try and play? As always, I do want to thank you all so much for watching, and stay tuned because I have more content coming. I will see you all in the next one. If you like this video and you'd like to help out with future projects on this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Also, if you enjoy the content of this channel, please remember to click on this subscribe button. Again, I want to thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.